intended many years ago to write this up as an article which I never did. And it's sort of a collection in my mind of things that early Midrand kings did that I admired. Uh, they're not necessarily great huge epic deeds, but they were things that I personally admired, that I said that that was a kingly thing to do, that was a, a noble thing to do. Um, and the, the first one uh, was uh, in the reign of the second mid-round king, it was Franz von Lickenrecht. And, uh, had to do with the coming uh, of the first mace in the Middle Kingdom, at least to my knowledge, the first mace in the Middle Kingdom. Now, the first mace in the Middle Kingdom was built by Andrew of Seldom Rest, whom some of you may have heard of, some of you may have possibly known. He's on the wall out there. But he was something like 6'3 and weighed 290 pounds, and most of it was muscle, uh, although he was also rather full in the front. Uh, like Signor Dimmerdell once said, we're all waiting for Andrew to calve, but it never happened. <laughs> anyway, uh, but he was a, a great big strong man who at that time had a, a very young baby daughter. I understand she is now grown up and an active member of the society. I was talking to a couple of folks in here the other day. And uh, they took a large quantity of her diapers, clean I'm glad to say, and wrapped them around the pole and created a maze in which the head was, I think, about the size of a soccer ball. And uh, Andrew showed up at a van in, in the med realm and wanted to find people with this thing. Now, uh, it says in the rules list, it still says, though nowadays it's usually delegated, that if there's a question about using a weapon in the list, the king decides. Nowadays it's usually his representative, you know, it's their marshal, or the marshal in charge, or whatever. But in those days, it particularly was the king. And they brought it to Franz von Wickenleck and basically said, can this great big guy take this great big thing and hit people with it? And Franz von Blickenrechten said, I will not ask any other fighter in my kingdom to fight against this weapon. It would be a great pity if no one fought him since he went to the trouble of making it. So I will go into the field and fight uh, against that weapon. And he did. Now, I'd say Franz was roughly my size, and while a competent fighter for his day, he got smashed. But, uh, you know, I thought it was a very kingly thing to do, to say, well, I'm not going to ask anybody else to do this, but I'll do it. Um, so that, that was the first one. All of these, I may say, are pretty short little stories, but they go on like that. The second one occurred in the third mid-realm crown tournament. Uh, when uh, Carrier Dark of the Bow was fighting to become the first mid realm duke, which he in fact successfully yeah. did. But you have to remember that at this point we're all practically uh, green as grass. We're very raw people. You know, I went into the second mid realm crown with like 20 minutes of fighting training. And there, were, there were people going into this third one with about the same. And uh, Carrier Dark was, was in around fighting one of our less experienced fighters, and he took off his arm. And he called hold, he stopped the fight. He said to him, now, have you ever been trained what to do when you've lost an arm? He said, no, all right. He said, I'm going to train you. This is what you do when you've lost an arm. And so he gave him a quick lesson, and you know, this is how you fight when you lost an arm. And I dare say he did, you know, by giving him those skills, prolong the gentleman's life by a significant number of seconds at all of that. My <laughs> uh, he did there. Um, and, uh, so that, that was a, a, uh, another story that I, I admired uh, at the time. I thought that was a, a kingly thing to do. Um, and uh, it's another story about um, Uriel of Brach, who is one of the, the more controversial early kings,
was off the mill. He was the, the fourth king. He reigned after Carrier Dog's second uh, reign. There are various traditions about him. If you read um, Duke Finvar's History of the Mid-Realm Kings, I don't know how available that is anymore, but if you can possibly get hold of it, you should. Sure. I believe well, there's, there's bits, it's not the whole thing, by any means. He wrote up a whole series of history of the Mid-Realm Kings, which is a, a fairly close adaptation of the style of the Roman history, I guess, of the late Roman history, because he was his original professional special. But anyway, um, his tradition of, of uh, King Ariel is, is favorable. Uh, my own tradition of King Ariel is on the whole, unfavorable because I was attached to his his uh, queen, uh, Morna of Kenneth. And that's another story which I may tell after this if I think of it. Uh, I don't know if body groups, I'll tell the story anyway when I get to it. But to tell you about the thing Ariel did that I did admire. Now, it was in Ariel's reign that the Dark Horde first appeared in the society, first appeared in the Middle Kingdom. The, the Dark Horde was originally a, a small group in uh, what is modernly uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm told they were basically originally members of the University of Michigan fencing team. I don't know that as a fact, but that's what I was told. And um, Yang the nauseating and uh, this is a cohort. These, these fellows all dressed in this very sinister black. And as someone was saying the other day, the, the rumor was they were a biker gang, but they weren't. But they, they, they came in. They were Mongol. The Yang walks into court and says, King, I bring you a boom. One day of peace. Now, and after that, that's um, it. And uh, there was, in fact, significant hostility between the Dark Horde and many, not all, but many people, particularly in the, the Barony of Northwoods so in, in East Lansing, which was the major SCA group in, in Michigan. There was a group called the New Cossack Army whose, whose basic intent was to slay the Dark Horde. Um, I might say the, the Dark Horde, they used to have uh, uh, events at tournaments, I think they occasionally still do, uh, where uh, you go out and uh, form a circle essentially and every fighter is against every other fighter. Now uh, that one, you can't attack them immediately next to you, but other than that it's a free fall. Well, the Dark Horde would go into that and they would essentially fight as a team in that, that kind of uh, uh, competition, the result that they won. And so one time I went in and, and just devoted myself to killing the Dark Horde. It was all of, what, four of them? Anyway, uh, and so I just took that out. Um, they did have a problem with their fighting. Uh, Carrier Dark wrote a song about them, which you may know. Uh, trouble on the field, Yang, trouble on the field. You can't keep up the image if you can't keep up your shield. Anyway, uh, but uh, um, there was this feeling between uh, particularly uh, the Horde and um, Ariel and some of the people in Northwood. And one time they were at a uh, tournament and there was a uh, melee team competition and you had two, two uh, groups of fighting each other in the melee. And Yang actually went to uh, the, the marshal who was presiding and asked him if he could bring his horde in as a surprise attack on the two teams. And the marshal said yes. This is one of those things marshals are not supposed to do. <laughs> the, the marshal said yes. And so just as these two teams were getting well embroiled with each other, the dark horde charged onto the field and slaughtered them. And there was a great deal of um, anger and frustration on the part of those two teams. And, uh, and uh, the king, who had seen it, uh, spoke very hasty and angry words about the Dark Horde. But then, to his credit, the marshal stepped forward and said, Yes, I did give Yang permission to do it. And when the king learned that the marshal had 
given Yang permission to do it. Um, the king called Yang forth and formally apologized to him. He said he had spoken in haste, he had spoken in anger, he had not known the facts of the case, and uh, he withdrew his words. And that was a kingly thing which I thought Irya Lebrana uh, did, though he was not in some ways my favorite king for other reasons. So, Maybe, maybe this is the time to go into that story. I read I didn't bring, I, I had a plot for this story because I've, I've still got the robes that were made. This is a story, says, Ariel is only a side figure, but it explains uh, perhaps in some ways why I was not on Ariel's side. Um, now, Ariel Branagh's queen, Morna of Kenneth, was a, in my opinion, surpassingly beautiful woman. She was also the, uh, she was also the the um, guild mistress of the Guild of Exotic Dancers, uh, which um, had a charter which has to be read to be believed. I regret I can't quote it verbatim. It was a remarkable thing. Uh, I might say uh, that uh, the the. Um, well-known Middle Kingdom cry of Booba uh, originated when the Guild of Exotic Dancers uh, presented their charter to the king and then uh, somebody said Booba and so it began. At all events, um, Ariel Branagh and more of Kenneth um, and um, see, I'm trying to keep this in order here. All right. Um, I was in correspondence with Morna of Kenneth over some other matters, and she told me that the Guild of Exotic Dancers um, uh, had fought, several of the members had fallen ill. And I wrote back and said I was very sorry to hear that they had been afflicted for their sins. And the next time that they performed, before they performed, uh, they uh, bandaged my eyes and uh, tied eyes so that I should not be led into sin by beholding their lascivious performance. And then I, uh, now this is when Mona and Ariel, I should say, were still prince and princes. And Teriadoc was king, and I filed a formal complaint with the king, a uh, uh, fairly uh, eloquent length. Um, and uh, the king asked Mora for a reply. Mora sort of, Mora and Ariel came to me and sort of said, are you really mad? I said, no, I'm not really mad. And, and was it not something along the lines of that, that piety is only good when it's tested and that you should have been allowed. I, <laughs> I, I no longer remember uh, the whole thing, but anyway, I, 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 but, so um, the king, Caradoc, uh, mediated a settlement of the dispute for which the, the Guild of Exotic Dancers agreed to provide me with a set of bardic robes, which I still have, and I will, uh, uh, at least I have the the underjacket, which I could still wear at least fairly recently, I'm not sure anymore, but I, I brought that with me and I meant to bring it today and I'm very sorry I didn't uh, think of that. It's in my tent. Um, but, um, so they presented the, that to me and um, then later when Uriel and Mona were on the throne, they had a competition uh, for uh, the uh, rank of Queen's Bar, and I composed a, a poem for uh, Morn of Kenneth, which I believe I can still recall. I had written it up from memory and I didn't bring that, but here we go. For near a year I found reason to disagree with her whom I am bound to serve royalty. Shall I seek sovereignty? Yes, this is clearly seen. This maid is fast of me. She is indeed my queen. When on tongues equal ground we meet in speaking free, never a maid I found so swift to answer me. Who may not answer be? She is a repartee. This maid has mastered me. She is indeed my queen. When to the pipe shop sound, 
She grants that we shall see such proofs as do abound of beauty's rarity, doomed to disparity, limbs of the maids more mean, all I script charity. She is indeed my queen, this maid has mastered me, as is in all things seen. I am no longer free, she is indeed my queen. And um, the, I won the, the title of Queen's Bard for that. And uh, they read it in court, but the fellow who read it in court, the Herald just had no idea how it was supposed to go. How it was supposed to go is why I've attempted to reproduce for you there. And um, so, uh, and, uh, so um, I, I became a Queen's Bar. And uh, there's another bit about a candle which escapes me now. I think that's as far as I can carry that tale. Um, but um, they, they, uh, so leaving goes by, and uh, shortly after that, I, I left the uh, middle. I went to the east, as I told yesterday. I, I fought in the first Pensic War, and because I fought in the first Pensic War for the east, I always thereafter fought for the Eastern Pensic Wars until uh, the uh, Kingdom of Ethelmark became a kingdom, at which point um, I referred myself to Ethelmark. Before that, although I might live in other kingdoms, and I always swore fealty to the king of that kingdom, I always did so, reserving my fealty to the crown of the East. And so I was fighting for the East in a Pensic War some years ago, and there was a bridge battle and uh, the king of the middle at that time was Ilya Vizak. And um, it, the eastern army broke through the bridge. And usually, as I'm sure most of you know, you've seen a bridge battle, you, know, you break the bridge, you get through their line, you've won the bridge battle. But as the eastern army was storming over the bridge, the king of the middle cried, rally on the king. The people of the middle rallied on the king. They pulled together right in front of us. It was an amazing thing. I'd never seen anything like it. And uh, they rallied around the king and they stopped us as we were smashing through them. We'd, we'd gotten across the bridge. They were scattered, but they pulled together and fought it and stopped and won the battle. I was astonished. I'd never seen that. Uh, such a direct example of the personal leadership of a king in battle. Uh, as I saw there from the uh, so, uh, those those are the tales I particularly know to tell at this occasion. And they probably wandered on, but I think the lady said she had another tale, so I don't mind.